uh, drawbridge networks. Uh, nope. Oh wait. I need to go forward. There. There we go. Told us not to do that. Yep. <laughs> All right. So let's try again. So yes, uh, 23 years information security experience and uh, a lot of that d dealing with uh, certificate authorities, encryption, and 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 the like. So. Um, pass it over to Chris. Awesome. Uh, what's going on, everybody? My name is Christopher Grayson. I am an Atlanta native. Uh, I went to the Georgia Tech uh, two times and then did some research there. Can't seem to get away. Uh, my my kind of full-time job prior to what I do now was penetration testing. Uh, so basically breaking into systems, whether those are digital, whether those are physical, anything like that, basically breaking into them, showing the companies how we did that, uh, advising them through the process of fixing the holes that we find. Um, and so I've got some interesting insights on, on how Let's Encrypt fits into that perspective on security. Uh, I am currently also involved with a startup. I actually started a business one year ago yesterday uh, called Website, and I'm a sole proprietor. I'm the only person at it, working hard to try and get it off the ground, um, and that's really me. Hey, hi everyone. Um, my name is Aaron Butler. I am a Miami native. Uh, I've been in IT for four years now. I am more of new blood, you know, uh, good kid that went bad. Now I'm a good guy, right? Um, I specialize in perimeter defense and firewall configuration and analytics, as well as more of a network side engineer. Um, last year I was president of a new student organization at Georgia Gwinnett College up the road. Uh, for essentially student gray hat hackers. Now um, I work for a security company locally that's based out of Atlanta, uh, doing as I said prior. And we're here to talk about. Yep. Uh, oh, wait, you gonna post it up? Yeah, I posted it. Okay, great. So, um, so we wanted me to mention the crypto challenge that uh, the FF is running this this session. I don't know a lot of the details uh, offhand, so it it's a, yeah, yeah. We have a, a contest, um, a, a contest that's basically puzzles that you can crack online, and uh, it's um, if you go to eff.dragoncon.org, that website is up there. There'll be a link to it, and it's all online so that you can you can do it on a smartphone, you can uh, do it on anything that's internet connected. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and you need a code. The code is Happy 30 for the 30th anniversary of DragonCon. You need that code to um, access the puzzle. Yeah, it's uh, so, so when I first got into information security, I was pretty kind of like. I actually got involved through a contest similar to this one. So if you guys are here, this is kind of one of the first times you're delving into this this uh, industry. A really good way to start is by participating in games like this. They're not as scary as they might sound. Uh, you will probably do a lot better than you may think. So give it a try. Um, by the way, who actually is new to network security or has n very little exposure to that? Raise your hand. We're not going to judge you out loud. There we go. See, there we go. Yeah. All right. Judge. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, so let's start uh, talking about Let's Encrypt. And and we were talking up here before and realized that some people might think this is a panel on just general encryption. Uh, there is a um, encryption 101 type uh, with uh, I think the title was the FBI uh, yeah, versus we're Apple. Covering the FBI versus Apple tomorrow. Yeah. So tomorrow. So there's another track that will talk about more general. If the conversation goes there, I mean, we can ask, answer questions about it. But the purpose of this uh, panel is to talk about Let's Encrypt, which is a service that just started up, uh, what have they been, about Months. three years? Yeah, yeah it's a, yep, uh, started in January. There we go. And so um, it's a service that allows for an easy uh, acquisition of a certificate, which, which you can then put on web services, uh, public web services like a web server, to uh, then uh, have that little nice HTTPS, and the you know uh, Google is is one of those in the industry that pushes you know HTTPS everywhere. They want, you know there's there's really no reason with computing power today that every web server out there can't be you know should be running uh, HTTPS, and that uh, that'll just you know solve all sorts of problems. Um, yeah, and and just to uh, to kind of dive into kind of what differentiates or what's so important about Let's Encrypt as compared to the way the kind of this mechanism worked previously is 
If you own a web application or a web server, if you have a website and you want to have HTTPS available on your website, well, that process was fairly involved. You had to work with a certificate authority. Uh, in a lot of cases, you have to do a bunch of technical stuff. You have to mit submit something called a certificate signing request. Uh, and then you have to pay money to this organization to simply run a script. Literally, you can generate these certificates with a single command line operation on your own machine, but because you don't have, you're not a certificate authority, your certificate is invalid. So you have to pay money, you have to interact with a third party. In a lot of cases, those third parties didn't do a very good job of keeping their stuff secure. Uh, so they, they failed pretty cat catastrophically on their end. So it's a fairly involved process to actually get that HTTPS uh, available on your application. And what that means is that all of the traffic, if you don't have that HTTPS thing going on in your web application, means that all of the traffic between a user that is browsing your website and your website is sent in the clear. If they're sitting at Star Starbucks, they log in, they're browsing things, they order something online, all of that data is being sent in plain text for anybody that is listening to observe. Let's Encrypt, on the other hand, the entire process can be automated. You don't have to deal with a, well, you still have to deal with a third party to some extent, but it's no longer this process where there's humans in the process as well. Uh, so you can literally automate the entire process of I'm going to stand up a server, I'm going to set up my DNS records, I'm going to point them at my machine, and then I'm going to gen I'm basically going to get a certificate using this application they built and deploy it. And it doesn't cost any money. Which is good. Um, so Kind of. <laughs> I've got some abuse like. cases. That <laughs> so, uh, so let me talk uh, quickly about HTTPS and certificates and certificate authorities since we're going to be using those terms. Um, so uh, the whole certificate, you know, public certificate thing is that it's, it's this web of trust is that when you go to a website and it says, uh, you know, I am going to encrypt this channel with you and here is my certificate. And it's a, just a digital code. And uh, that gets cryptographically signed uh, by, um, by these certificate authorities that he mentioned that are embedded in your uh, operating system and embedded in your browser as these root authorities. And so there's this chain of trust that goes from these root authorities to other uh, you know, uh, sub-authorities and intermediate authorities and, and get down to the cer certificates that you're, you're passing around. And so uh, the reason that you can't just you know, do this on your own if you're running your own website is that you, you, when you generate your own certificate, nobody will trust it. And if you ever hit a website and, and uh, it says, uh, you know, warning there is a problem with the site certificate, uh, do you want to continue? And you have to, like, make an exception for that website. Anybody run across that? I see a few nodding heads. Yeah, you, right? You've probably said yes every time. <laughs> Everybody, just yeah, just say, oh, yeah, of course. Except I for that guy. Um, and especially in, in like internal uh, applications, uh, that because it's uh, it's there's more challenges there, and we can talk about that later. Um, and so uh, so the idea is is that uh, to to have a certificate that automatically encrypts and turns your little icon green with a little lock on it, and everything's uh, hunky dory. It has to be part uh, trusted by a certificate authority, and so they kind of used to kind of hold the, the the hold the cojones and you got you got to work with them to get that certificate certificate trusted now that's the that's the, one of the differences in let's encrypt is that it is you know freely available for everyone to you know uh, apply this and you don't have to mess with those certificate authorities that control their own rules and prices and things like that so I let me make an oversimplification because I like them before, everyone had a secret handshake, and no one had the same two, except if you belonged to that exclusive gang. And you had to pay money to be in that gang that had the secret handshake. Now, they've taken out all of the handshaking by other people, and you can learn that secret handshake on your own at little to no cost, making everyone in on the joke or the handshake, which is encryption. This is why it's beneficial to you, because websites that you run don't they don't have to go through the 50 steps to encrypt it it's only two give or take so just to uh for for one last kind of attempt to to map kind of because basically the mechanism behind ssl certificates the way that it works public key infrastructure is fairly complicated 
and it's fairly convoluted and it uses cryptography, which if there's anybody in here that's ever been in a cryptography class, you know just how terrible it is to try to understand that stuff. So basically, you have a number of centralized powers that are given some amount of authority. These are called trust anchors. This is where the, the chain of trust uh, originates from. These trust anchors are embedded in your browser. Basically every browser you can get, you can open it up on your phone, you can open it up on your laptop, and you can see that your browser has a set of something called root CAs that it trusts. These are root certificate authorities that say, that basically this browser is configured to say, well, if I'm following a chain of trust and the root of that chain of trust is in this list, then I'm going to see this as legitimate. So what do those root CAs do? Well, mapping this into the physical world, which is one of the, the ways that I like to try to explain things in security, uh, think of it as, let's say that there's only one root CA. We've only got one person, and they now, basically they have a number of folks that they trust as well. So they draft these documents, and they sign them, and they give each a, one, a copy of this document to each person that they trust, and now, if you interact with any one of those other parties, you can say, hey, let me see, that, let me see that, that document that you got there. You look at it, you see the signature on it, and you say, okay, well, if that guy trusts you, I trust you now. You repeat that process, okay? So those guys can, can do their own certificates and then give those out, and you go so on and so forth. And then where you fit into the picture, if you have your own web server, is you contact one of these folks in the chain and you say hey this is my domain here's proof that i own it through various mechanisms and they go ahead and draft something and say okay i trust that you actually own this and that certificate is what is used to encrypt communication or the contents of that certificate is what is used to encrypt the, the communication between the two so you have a set of root trust you have kind of layers of uh, a trust that are delegated out to sub parties and then you are at the bottom of those chains. So that is basically, you have your browser, they trust those roots, you contact a web server, you get the certificate from them, you can cryptographically attest that this was actually sent through this chain of people, therefore if that root CA gave all of this authority to these guys and they gave that authority to you, I'm going to go ahead and trust you and we're going to talk using this cipher and this key. And that is what PKI basically does for you. There's a lot of flaws in that approach. It's great before you add humans into the equation, as most things are, uh, but that is PKI. So hopefully that will dispel any potentially remaining confusion around how the mechanism that lets encrypt replaces works. So, um so we wanted to make sure that we covered our bases on <coughs> letting you know, you know, you know, one, that we're talking about this service and not just a generalized uh, 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 encryption talk, and two, that we give a, a proper introduction uh, to certificate functionality and whatnot, and we can dive into, uh, you know, how the service works next. Uh, but I did want to take a pause and see, um, you know, the, the for questions or, or uh, any any notes at this point before we move forward. And, if we've got the cube out somewhere, there it is. There's a, this orange cube is an actual microphone, so uh, and they're recording all of this, so be sure to grab the cube before asking a question. Cool. Uh, what's the validation process from these root CAs all the way down to Let's Encrypt or whatever huge number of organizations that are trying to give these out? So um, basically we're talking about electronic signatures at that point. It's, it's uh, you know, uh, that they're, they say, uh, just like his, his analogy there where you're signing a paper and next person signs, and then that's why we call it signatures is because it's a cryptographical proof that uh, that, that person signed it or that company signed it, and that's, that's how you kind of prove your, your, and that's built into the certificate encryption. So uh, I, can, I can go deeper, but does, does that... Well, so the, the, the actual validate, are you talking about the validation process? So basically, how do they know that you own that domain? Is that what you're asking? Well, from organization to organization, yeah. That's that you're not able to just say there's something Okay, so basically, you have something called a DNS. Uh, and what DNS does is it maps things that are uh, memorable to humans to uh, internet addresses, IP addresses. Uh, so, for instance, when you type in www.google.com into your browser, behind the scenes, your browser actually does a DNS lookup to see, hey, where is the actual internet address of www.google.com? They get the IP address back, they connect to it. 
So DNS basically has a mapping from things that humans can remember into addresses that computers can use. Uh, in that DNS system, uh, you also have records that give details about how mail is supposed to be handled with for that domain. So for instance, I'm sure people, everybody here has, a, has an email address. You have something at gmail.com, something at whatever.com. Similarly, mail systems will retrieve a specific record out of DNS to know where they're supposed to route mail to. In most cases, when you have to do some amount, basically the, I'm sure you've also seen in Google Chrome where it's like, you'll go to some website and there'll just be a nice little lock on it. And then you'll go to your banking website and there's a whole green bar, which has like the name of the organization and stuff like that. There's varying levels of attestation that you can do to existing, uh, to existing CAs. Uh, and if you do the highest one where it's like you have to send in like a photo ID, you have to do this, that, and the other thing, then you get the highest assurance SSL certificate that says, yes, we have really gone, thrown this guy through the ringer to know that he owns this asset. But the lowest level that you'll see most commonly is, okay, well, you have to own an email address at that domain. So they go ahead and say, okay, well, you, you have to prove that you own this domain. So we're going to send an email. You have, to give, you have to give me an email address where the domain is actually this domain specifically. So that's the way that they are relying upon. You, you're not able to, to access email in, from an email address that's underneath that domain. Uh, and you're not, de basically, you're not hijacking their DNS either, which if you're able to do that, they've got much bigger problems than SSL certificates. But that's the most common method of uh, verification that I have seen. Let's Encrypt, on the other hand, uh, does something interesting where it has a piece of software. So instead of opening a browser and going to a website and applying for an SSL certificate, it's literally something that you just run from the command line. And you say, hey, CertBot, I want to get uh, SSL certificates for these domains. And what it does on the back end is it actually looks up the IP addresses associated with those domains, it finds those IP addresses, and then it contacts the server at that IP address. Now, that's what happens on the remote side. On the local side, the command line utility that you're using actually stands up a web server and then hosts some information on it. So basically, stands up a web server, has information here, tells the remote authority, hey, we're trying to get an SSL certificate for these domains. It uses DNS to find the IP addresses associated with those domains. It contacts those IP addresses, and then it checks to see if that information is available on that web server at those IP addresses. So if you're trying to get an SSL certificate for something that you don't own, and you don't own the DNS for, then the remote service connects to a server that you have no ability to control. And that's the validation process that they use. And uh, it's called ACME. I forget what the acronym stands for. but that's what they use in Let's Encrypt. And, and to put it into an analogy, um, that uh, you know, if, if you're in your home, uh, previously to, to work with a regular uh, CA, you would basically be corresponding via postal mail. And they would say, well, assume you live there because we can exchange mail. And so that, that's, that's, that's what was happening before. Let's Encrypt uh, basically you know, comes to your house. Knocks on your door. Yeah, says yep. is it, they look up your, your address, they go to your house, uh, yep. they, you know, send information to your house, and then and then Let's Encrypt agent that runs on your web server uh, uh, responds with uh, verifying information. So so that that's it's one of the, the changes in Let's Encrypt. Uh, you know, uh, and it changes the way that SSL you know really really works and uh, makes it so much easier uh, for uh, a lot of different applications. Okay, we spent some time on that question. Was there any other questions before we go deeper into setting up? Uh, go ahead. I imagine we'd be able to prove these things. This thing, it's... Um, so when you're filling out a certificate signing request, you can input certain functions that you want that certificate to be able to do. Like, of course, Let's Encrypt focuses on um, web traffic encryption, but there's also email encryption and uh, co specific code signing, like binary signing, I believe, yep. and other things like that. Does Let's Encrypt also, um, will it accept certificates that request a extra um, functionality like that, or will it only sign off on things that are asking for web encryption? I believe it's only web at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, I believe it's only, they're definitely focused on web, I can say that, but as far as any of those other cryptographic operations that you're speaking of uh, go, they only require a private key. And you have a private key associated with the certificate that you receive. So I don't know if there's other steps that are implemented in the CSR 
uh, kind of like on the server side that it's like, oh, we're, we're going to communicate with Apple and, and tell them that, hey, this is the new key that you're signing your software with and we're going to automate that process. But I don't see why the cryptographic primitives that you receive through this process could not be used for those purposes. Now, for code signing, you're usually, uh, you know, code signing for an OS and you're going to ask from, from Microsoft or from Apple. Um, and, uh, and so those specifically, th they're kind of locked in. Um, but that... Um, uh, the, the part of the Let's Encrypt model basically it means that you're, you're doing something on the public web. And so this also, I mentioned before, you, you know, doing internal web servers that don't reach the outside traffic um, and that, uh, that Let's Encrypt is not a model for. Um, and so, so there is some limitation, so yes, but Let's Encrypt is basically uh, in its core you know, for web uh, certificates. Okay. Oh, one in the back. One more. Yeah. Just throw it at his face. There you go. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if this is in the scope of the talk or if you all might know about this. Um, so CA Cert's been doing something like this without the nice tool that Let's Encrypt has where you don't have to like actually get your identity, and identity verified by somebody that's already part of CA Cert. Um, but how did... I guess, do you, do you all know what strings Let's Encrypt pulled to get installed as a root cert out of the box in these browsers, browsers now? Because CA cert, I still have to install that root authority. Let's Encrypt was founded by a lot of techno the, the tech giants. Um, uh, no Google. Uh, who else was in the foundation? I'm not uh, sure. Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm sure Facebook is in the middle. I mean, the, these are the kind of, you know, West Coast giants there that, that you know, when a, a good idea comes around and, you know, it makes sense. Uh, that I'm sure they don't like dealing with the CAs either. Uh, that you know, that they, they they're the ones that help push to get them uh, into a root uh, into the root cert yeah, organization. I, I know um, Mozilla's in there too. Okay. Um, a couple other ones, Google, blah blah blah. But Mozilla and Google, what more do you want? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Good. <laughs> They've got the they've got a, the majority of the browser market. Uh, but so I was actually reading about this earlier because I, I it's a good question of of how do they actually push this through because. Really, the the whole way that CA, or well, the basically certificate authorities worked previously is kind of like a cartel. Uh, it's just extortion. It's literally they're not even provide. I mean, it, they don't do due diligence on their end, and uh, in some cases they get compromised to uh, pretty severe extents that have pretty severe implications. Uh, and they're charging money for something that costs them nothing, and, and as far as processing power goes. And, and there's there's no real authority that they that manages them. Yeah, by like the way, uh, the government of China has a CA that your browsers trust. So yeah, like take that, for, for instance. Uh, however, <laughs> one of the ways that, uh, that is basically listed on their page that they had, had their certificates implemented in, or integrated into browsers is they have their root CA and they signed some others and then another CA that was already trusted by all of the browsers also signed those. Uh, so they also worked with another authority that was already kind of within the realm of trust to help get their get their uh, things pushed forward. So they're cross-signed. I believe so. Yeah. 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 Uh, Let's Encrypt does their 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 certificate authorities is, is cross-signed at the at the root. Yep. I just have one question about that Chinese CA. Is that is that the name? Uh, is that the company WoSign? Is that the name of it? I don't know. Okay. There was some recently thing about how the, the WoW sign was a CA and it was issuing like duplicate certificates and uh, something like they somebody found out and then they bought the company that did and just trying to squash information. I'm not sure if that was the company or not. <laughs> so. There's, uh, again, uh, public key infrastructure is great on paper. Yeah. And then when you throw humans into it, I mean, really, a lot of governments have the, uh, the, have the CA basically privileges and authorities. So if they want to man in the middle of your traffic, they have the ability to because they can sign any certificate that they want. Uh, so PKI, PKI, it's great in theory. It has not worked superbly well in implementation. <laughs> uh, and that's a, brought up another good point is, is, as we were kind of laying the groundwork here is that um, SSL does encrypt, like we said, from the endpoint to the server. Um, if you get the private key of that certificate, 
you can uh, then uh, decrypt the traffic that, that goes on. And so there is man in the middle attacks in which uh, you know you connect. You think you're connecting to, to Starbucks, and you're actually connecting to uh, somebody else. And Me. Yeah. yeah. And if they can steal, <laughs> you know, it, it, you know, that they can try to you know, do some man in the middle um, with with some of these stolen certs. Right, so so if you go get a Chinese cert that is root trusted, uh, your computer's not going to really know any difference. That uh, except for your browser, then has code that says, uh, you know, wait, I'm I'm getting signed, uh, I'm going to Google.com, but I'm getting uh, the, the certificate is for uh, is 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 for coming from another uh, source, and so uh, that's where you'll get you know some of the other warnings and and that uh, to help protect from uh, those men in the middle. But it's also a corporate solution. Uh, companies do uh, SSL decrypt uh, a lot of companies and so what they do is because they manage all the uh, all, all of their endpoints mm -hmm. they install their own root, uh, root certificate or certificate authority uh, being their own company their own internal certificate authority and, uh, and and so what that means is is that they can then present a certificate and uh, that um, allows them to for you to still browse uh, in, you know encrypted sites on the on the web but that uh, they're you know as you exit the company they're decrypting it looking at the code and then uh, re-encrypting it and sending it on um, for information security purposes usually and, and just to kind of kind of elaborate on uh, Ellen Xavier saying here is so who here has ever had a job where you're given a laptop by your company Okay, so remember previously when we were talking about your browser has a list of trusted root CAs, right? It's just a list. If somebody gains access to that list, they can throw new things onto it. The whole process of verification as far as your browser is concerned is it's going to look at what it's receiving, it's going to go up the chain of trust to the root trust authority, and it's going to see if that root trust authority is within the list of things that it trusts, and if the answer is yes, then it's going to say, okay, well, then I can connect to this, it's going to be fine. Kind of one of the implicit things that I don't think has been explicitly stated here is that in order for PKI to work, you have to have a lot of integrity. Every single one of those steps in that chain has to have integrity. That doesn't come around so often. Yeah, it's not, it turns out it's not, that's, not, that's not really the case very often. So when you get that corporate laptop, it's already been provisioned by IT. They installed the operating system on it. They installed your software on it. They also installed a root CA in your browsers, in your, in your device, potentially all the way at the operating system level that they own. So now they are able to create SSL certificates that your browser and your machine is going to trust for arbitrary domains, for google.com, for Outlook 365, for anything like that. So if you have one of these devices, just because you see a nice little lock on your traffic does not mean that you're not going to get in trouble for the browsing you should not be doing on your work device. Fair Preach warning. it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Always have a person. And device. there's an interesting story about uh, where Semantic actually did this accidentally. Uh, and uh, being yeah, in the security... They, they, where they, they injected themselves into the CA. Yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. Okay. So, so their software modified... Antivirus. Yeah. It modified the CA list and injected their own. And they were using a, basically a forged certificate uh, to do SSL decrypt for some of the security functions. Uh, it was discovered security. by a. It was discovered by a uh, Google employee that does the. Uh, uh, yeah, she she was on a plane and uh, you know got in. Uh, oh wait, I'm sorry. Cross the stories. That's that's when uh, uh, GoGo -Go was doing their own SSL decrypt. Uh, but yeah, I mean, so it was discovered and a lot of bag on the face. Um, uh, for for semantic and and, uh, and and another reason to move away from the yeah. old school AVs. And ever since then, semantic antivirus has never been installed on any of your computers, right? <laughs> oh wait, yeah. never mind. So, all right, I got another question back. If uh, uh, CA's uh, sign and cert gets stolen, or if the company goes out of business, you got to revoke all those certs and start from scratch. So, what's the security like around there? signing cert and what's the odds that they're going to stick around i mean let's encrypt yeah ah, that's oh well let, so so let's talk a little bit about the revocation process so as part of the certificate authority technology you know and 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 what 
it, it, uh, how it functions, uh, there's a revocation process where I've lost a cert, it's been stolen, it's been lost, and I want to revoke it immediately. Um, there is uh, basically the uh, process goes up to your you know certificate, whoever signed that, and issues a you know, revocation uh, and puts that. There's it's called a certificate fingerprint. Um, that will say this, this specific certificate uh, should no longer be trusted and, and they get pushed down by the CAs and that there are uh, you know, different channels in which your computer can receive those uh, those revocations and so um, and, and, and so when you know the next person comes around and goes to that website um, if it's been revoked um, and your browser is actually doing revocation checking uh, then big then gotcha right there yeah. that's a big gotcha because yeah that's a, that's a big issue is, is that a lot of browsers don't check for it uh, that um, that then you'll get the you'll get an error um, and so that's how it's supposed to work but like I said the um, uh, Java is one of the, the ugliest ones about this. Is, is that uh, uh, signing signing stuff in Java so that it'll run and you trust that it's been you know compiled by IBM or whoever, um, and, y and they've got that certificate. Uh, still doesn't do r revocation checking, um, and so uh, uh, you know, and so th there could be a, n a good number of invalid certs that you know Java will check. And um, I don't know the current status on. Like current browsers and and their ability to check those is it, is a default for any of them now? Uh, I want to say that CRLs are pulled down by default by most modern browsers. Uh, but so I can't speak specifically to strategies that Let's Encrypt implements to try and address these problems. I can state that Let's Encrypt by default only issues certificates for three months at a time. So in a worst case scenario, you lose the certificate, somebody else gets a copy of that certificate, they only have it for up to three months if they popped it on the first day that it got, that it got yeah. published out there. Additionally, uh, Let's Encrypt does not do wildcard certificates. So you don't have, you don't run the risk of, okay, well actually, so let me back up a bit and then and give some background information on what I'm actually talking about. An SSL certificate is basically tied directly, well, there's a fully qualified domain name SSL certificate and there's a wildcard SSL certificate. So a fully qualified domain name SS SSL certificate is going to be something that says, we certify that this machine really is www.google.com. It specifically says www.google.com. A wildcard SSL certificate on the other hand, if you actually pull the certificate down and you look at the contents of the certificate, instead of saying www.google.com, it will have an asterisk.google.com. That SSL certificate is valid for anything.google.com, www.google.com, mail.google.com, drive.google.com, images.google.com. That SSL certificate can validate or basically verifies that if you're talking to that server and its do domain is something.google.com, then you're supposed to trust it. So a wildcard SSL certificate is inherently much more powerful than a single domain SSL certificate. If you lose one of those, then somebody can effectively impersonate any subdomain that you have, anything.yourbusiness.com, right? Those are not issued by Let's Encrypt. So the attack surface that you potentially have for people compromising those two certificates is greatly reduced, comparatively speaking. But the uh, uh, the let's let's encrypt an, uh, revocation process. You can do it from the agent, um, or you can issue it through through the uh, send an email in to. Uh, but it's it's you're still going to have to to mo all of secure communication with let's encrypt servers is is going to be through that agent that you're running on your web server. And so um, the basically, if you email them, they're, they're going to tell you the, the process of how to use the agent to do the revocation. But at that point, then it's just a normal revocation, certificate revocation with all of its um, you know, pros and cons. And, and so did, did that answer your question? Yes, Hagrid. Oh. Oh, is there one? Oh, very oh I got then one. Hagrid. Um, all right, all right. I guess I'll set up a scenario and then ask the question. So let's assume like Bank of America uses VeriSign, right? Um, and then I've got a root CA that I set up for my business and I'm using like uh, Squid Proxy to do SSL man in the middle for whatever, I need to punch it through a uh, IDS. Um, if I install 
EFFs, I think it's HTTPS everywhere, and they use the SSL observatory, does that tell the user on their browser, like, hey, Bank of America should be using VeriSign, not random company PFSense cert? I'm not familiar with uh, SSL observatory, so I'm not, I really can't say. Yeah, it, it's, so our, uh, the browsers that we have used, so they set up the certificate and there's all these fields. There's, you know, like he was talking about the domain name field. There's an expiration date. Um, there is other, you know, metadata that kind of gives you additional points to verify uh, and to help, you know, with the problems of, you know, forged certificates and, and reusing, uh, you know, revoked certificates. Um, but it takes the OSs or the browsers specifically to implement that. Um, very recently, within the last six months, uh, um, Firefox, I think, took the first step, and then uh, Chrome right behind. I don't keep up with what Microsoft does in their Edge browser. Um, but uh, where they basically started looking at, you know, ex uh, looking at domain name mismatch. Um, um, and all of a sudden, um, like I, I was us I'm using one of those kind of free services for, a, for just an about me page. And um, and then you go to it and it defaults to HTTPS, but then it gives you a warning because it's it's like you know uh, you know the the web service that dot com versus you know Xavier dash dot com, and so you know and so all of a sudden there's a lot of websites that got broken. You know, Mozilla you know screamed for a year saying we're going to do this, we're going to do this, we're going to do this, and finally pulled the trigger. And of course then there was a lot of websites that that went down uh, or you know just ga gave that certificate error. Um, and um, and so uh, it's 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 steps like that where we you know we're s the people that care about this stuff and really want you know uh, uh, encryption to work and H uh, HTTPS to work um, it's like Microsoft and I mean like uh, Mozilla and uh, and Chrome uh, is that um, they see they keep pushing the envelope and they'll start to to require more and more uh, the m if you've got if I, d I don't know the details of the tools that you mentioned, but basically SSL man in the middle, uh, you know, the only requirement is fi making sure that that root, um, that root is trus trusted. Yeah, so uh, so do the, these the tools do out of band verification of like what root CA actually signed the certificate for the endpoint that you're talking to? I've never heard of a tool that, that basically does out-of-band verification for, oh, well, that CA is the one that's supposed to have signed this endpoint. No, because they'll change. Uh, you yeah. know, they'll, just, they'll get fed up with a VeriSign and move to something else. All right? and, and, that's, and that there's no, that's not a technical attribute. Yeah. And, and that's kept up with on who it's it's is the certificate trusted yeah, or not? Is the, is is, the is question is, that is, is asked. And, and yeah. do the do the fields that we are checking for match up or not? And so, so things like revocation checking and and expiration checking is is one of those where browsers have had those optionally in their their config, but then are stepping up requirements for that. Um, and then yeah, question from. Uh, yeah, so I've been I actually been using Let's Encrypt for a while. Um, I love it because I can put it into like Ansel playbooks and stuff and just get it to spin up, which is awesome. Um, my question though is that there are some situations in which a wildcard cert would be very awesome to use. <laughs> um, just just in things like a hackathon kind of create site creation, like a lot of site creation. Um, do you think they're ever going to add that in? Is it just like they're no, nope, they will never do it, kind of thing. Or? It's so easy to 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 for the process. Once you learn how to set it up, like I said, you you, you can script a lot of that out. And so, right. um, it's uh, as from an offensive perspective, I hope they do. That would make my job a <laughs> lot easier. Uh, so within DNS, which again DNS is the the technology that is being used for the verification process. Uh, you have various types of DNS records which are in place. Um, and so you have like A records, TXT records, C name records, all these different things. C name records uh, are actually used to point one domain name to another. So basically an A record would say, hey, www.google.com is actually at this IP address. A C name record would say, 
www.google.com is actually at the IP address of this other domain. So what is the problem there? Well, the verification process is trying to see if you actually own this domain. And they're doing that by figuring out where this domain is pointing, connecting to that server, and then seeing if you own it, and seeing if that's where the authority uh, is currently working off of, or basically where your, your agent is currently working off of. So uh, some friends of mine that I know a few people in the audience are, are quite familiar with uh, have done some pretty cool research where there's a lot of organizations that have existing DNS CNAME records, uh, and they point to domains that have expired. If the domain has expired, I can buy that domain. If your process of verification for, oh, well, I'm going to give you a wildcard certificate for yourcompany.com, and what you need is to show that you own at least one subdomain of that entire thing, and you have a CNAME record that has expired that points to a domain that I can buy, I can get a wildcard SSL certificate for your business. Does, does that make sense to you? Does that answer the question? Yeah. Okay. I would love that. I mean, that's a, I would love that. That's a huge problem like that. <laughs> well, from, from a defensive perspective. From an offensive perspective, it's delicious. From a defensive perspective, deny all. No. <laughs> okay, don't do that. But it, it, yeah. the, the potential for exploitation is incredibly vast depending on how motivated a threat actor is, how much resources they have, or how bored they are. And from, <laughs> and, and from a, uh, I mean, anytime that you're talking about defensive security controls, I mean, one of the things that you want to do is contain uh, an incident if it happens. So to, to Xavier's point previously of, well, first off, this isn't, is entirely automatable. So you can have an Ansible, you know, spin up, figure out your domain name, pull your SSL certificate, and do this in automated fashion. It is now possible to automate this entire process of SSL certificate generation. Uh, and in that case, if one of them gets compromised, that does not fall over and in turn compromise all the other assets that you have. So it's a, good, it's a very good question. Because I was even looking at this up, I was like, do they support SSL certificates? I feel like that's a bad idea. And then I thought about it some more, I was like, no, that's a really bad idea. And then I talked to some friends about some research opportunities. But no, I hope, I hope that they don't <laughs> do that. I don't think they have plans yeah. to. Is that how we spin it? It's definitely not a technical issue, but it def it, it Let's Encrypt to get where they are now has had to go through so many battles. Like this has been, it's now, we, we can now reap the benefits of their efforts and it's great and I love it. I love Let's Encrypt, I love using it. They have been in the shadows working on getting this done for a pretty decent amount of time, two, two years at least, and the fact that they've gotten to the point where it's like, we'll give you a single SSL certificate for a single domain is pretty astonishing. So uh, it's more of a security barrier than it is a technical barrier, that's for sure. So I, w I wanted to, to bring up another scenario. So we've talked. So he talked about A name records to C name and C names that, that go to another, either another C name or an A name. A name. Uh, but then there's also, you know, when you go to a you know, web hosting company, you know, Go GoDaddy or something like that, um, you're going to have kind of the opposite where you got one server, one IP address hosting, uh, you know, hundreds, maybe thousands of websites. Um, and so, um, and so the, that wildcard domain, and then that was, you know, the, the problem I was having with my, uh, I think it was Wix or something, you know, whatever, you know, so was that it was, you know, their said, is, let's say it was Wix, it was, you know, it was start at wix.com or something and and so they had set up this you know general certificate that um and then once they started doing hosting verification uh you know to to look at what the actual uh you know website's name is in your browser so now your browser's you know stepping up the level of security um that that's kind of what happened there and so um and 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 so uh so you do have the instance of where you know one to many, but then there's also many to one uh, in a situation as well, and, and and that's why it's it's down to domain names, specific domain names, and not uh, you know uh, this IP address or this you know, this, uh, this C name and things like that. So it's whatever's and remember it's your browser doing the verification. So whatever the browser is going to be doing uh, is, is is where the security lies. A browser, you can probably go in there and muck with the settings and and make a lot of different certificates work. Some corporations do this. Um, 
poorly. I mean, it's it's a bad bad thing for them to do, but it makes their you know if they're trying to do SSL decrypt or other you know magical stuff uh, with uh, uh, being able to monitor their systems. They'll say, ah, we'll just in, you know, instead of doing the you know installing a root CA in there, uh, we'll just turn off this setting inside the browser. Um, hopefully, it's not. so. So again, the, it, all the verification steps that we talk about is, is the capabilities of the browser, um, and then what is in the certificate uh, to to verify. Are there any more questions? <laughs> How does this work for proxy servers? Like, if I'm using a proxy server, how does it verify, like, Bank of America or whatever? Uh, can you can you explain a little bit more like, about what you mean by like a proxy? Like, if I want to go to Bank of America, but I'm using a proxy server site, and then to add to then access the Bank of America instead of going directly to. If you are ever using an SSL proxy, you have to click through the warning saying that this S this certificate is not trusted. Okay, so, so they don't validate. Yeah. No, no. I mean, that's that's basically if you're saying that I'm going to access that site, but I'm going to bounce my traffic through this endpoint, then they're they're like, well, that's that's your own business, okay. and you do that, and you have to click through. So. But but if you're using a um, you know a SOX proxy. Or you know, or a website proxy that um, you know um, a lot of companies use. Um, the proxying is on the IP la uh, layer, all right. And so you're getting connectivity uh, through that layer, and the proxy is going to forward on that information. Um, so it it becomes invisible to the browser. You go into the browser and you set your proxy settings. And and the, so when I say I want to go to CNN.com, it does a DNS lookup, and and then uh, I'm going to go to this IP address. But then I've configured a proxy, so then I know that as a browser, I know to, I'm going to go send that request to this proxy, and that proxy is going to go get that information for me and hand it back. And all of that is not uh, on the application layer; it's 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 TCP. And so uh, so basically, it's a lower layer than what we're talking about certificates, because certificates is all uh, application layer. You, know, you 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 pull that down, um, and it's all. Um, it th through your browser again, and so uh, with a SOX proxy, you're not going to have that problem because you're the the SOX proxy is not proxying the cer the certificate itself. It's just grabbing data and forwarding it forward. It doesn't know it's a certificate, uh, as opposed to what he mentioned, which it's is a, a proxy. yeah. Uh, uh, and and uh, if you ever use like they have like JavaScript. Uh, like uh, you know, VPNs where you know, you're routing your traffic through uh, uh, something to get an, a anonymity. That will also break those, and that's another scenario in which the, the, the they'll break the certificates, and you'll you'll start to get warnings, or or some sites won't work. Yeah, my I, I, I apologize. I should have clarified that I was talking about web proxies. Yeah, not socks. Yeah. Not uh, one back there, and then there was another one up front here. So this is sort of going a little further. Uh, I think most technical people will agree that PKI is a pretty flawed system. Could you see it maybe being replaced by something in the future, like some kind of decentralized trust blockchain sort of thing? Um, I mean, it, it, it all comes, so in pure PKI back in the PGP days, right? You know, it was, it was a gr that 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 was the great system. It was all peer to peer. It was purely peer to peer, um, but it was a, a pain in the ass to manage, right? And and uh, tell people your key and you know get your public key out there. There wasn't a, you know, uh, uh, pgp.com slash Xavier Ash where I can just publish my PGP key. Um, and so out of that, you know, the PKIs kind of move toward you know creating a service like that uh, to then make it so you have this web of trust and now I can do things on the public internet that uh, uh, that, that basically you know um, allows for uh, publication of public keys and, and, and using certificates as opposed to just pure uh, you know PKI uh, as a saying you know going another way um, you know with let's encrypt um, you're not dealing with the pain in the butt rules that the you know ver signs of the world get, you know make you do um, and so it's it's it, it is revolutionary in that aspect 
and um, you know, and we'll see. You know, you know that uh, I think we still need certificate authorities because it is still a, a web of trust, but that um, the people that really care about the security are, are starting to get more more uh, you know time at the at the mic. Uh, you know, and so let's encrypt us here. We're talking about it, and and that that mindset will continue to grow. And yeah, if everybody started leaving the you know high-priced uh, you know uh, bear signs, then you know, then yes, I mean things will change. But that's uh, so I don't know enough about blockchain as I should. I think it's a very intriguing technology that I should really just sit down and and, and learn how it works. Uh, that being said, that's the only anomaly that I am familiar with that could potentially change the answer that I'm about to give. But my, I mean, the number one question is, well, who basically controls PKI? You have nations that control them. Uh, that would really not find any reason to give up that amount of power. Uh, so is PKI going to go away? Is our CA certificates, gonna, like root CA is going to go away? Uh, unless there is a technology that can be integrated across the entire internet in a fashion that can be done without the adversarial relationship you have with the nations that currently control the way this process works, then no, it's not going anywhere. But blockchain could very well be a technology that provides the platform necessary to make that happen. Uh, same problem with DNS. You know, the DNS in DNS general. Sec is is uh you know it's a very basic <coughs> protocol but you know nation states have their own servers and and then so uh, you know similar problems arise from that so move on yep yeah, uh, currently we I'm, i manage the ssl certificates for for my company and we, we we're looking at cutting you know budget line items everywhere I want to tell the story that Let's Encrypt will cut that area of the budget. Yeah. And uh, the only question that I keep getting pushed back in is, do they offer EV, EV certs, the extended validations, and web extended um, validations? Or, and what the algorithm strength is. Do you ha does it require SHA-256? Are we still pu pushing SHA-1? SHA um, I know on the, the certificate strength that they have the uh, the same range as like uh, um, um, uh, was it Gen GenCert uh, you know, from um, uh, most Linux platforms. You know, is you, you you get the choices of um, key length and and the type, right? DSA, RSA, or um, what's the four letter one? EC. DM or something like that. Uh, they are, and, and th that third option, by the way, is a future, like they, they built it about halfway, and, and the complete infrastructure will be using that new um, so signing method. Extended validation will be in effect. Well but well, that's not extended option. validation. So extended valid So that's the method, uh, that's the cryptology part, right? That's the, the key, and how, how, how you know, strong is, your, is, is the key to, to break that. That's, so that's, cryptology is different from uh, what you asked was the, um, about the, the ex extended verification. And that's those extra attributes in the certificate that allows for that extra checking um, if, if, you know, like you said, to get those names in there. Um, and and so, so saying all that is I don't know. Uh, I, you know, it's one of those yeah, that I, I, I haven't. I'm not aware of I, that, anything that supports it's that. It's been a while since I've perused the forums and, 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 uh, and taken a look at, you know, I did read before coming in here, like the, the what's new, where, where are they coming, uh, where are they about to release and things like that so that I could uh, speak, uh, speak on that. But uh, nothing in there mentioned extra validation. So you either do right now, and if you've already confirmed that they don't, then it's not in the near term release. I, I would say that it's, if I was in a situation where I had to basically deploy SSL certificates across an entire enterprise, I would probably use Let's Encrypt for the vast majority of things, things that are not going to be business critical. But for if, you, if you're in an organization which is already asking for, hey, we need that big green bar in the browsers, then I would maintain those capabilities uh, for those specific sites, because I would imagine that's probably not for every single one. Correct. Correct, yeah. So, so basically use Let's Encrypt everywhere else. And then I, especially considering the size of Let's Encrypt and how many people are actually working behind it and the fact that 
is it a nonprofit? Yes. It is. So it's so we're even looking at a nonprofit organization. So it's like we're not talking about them staffing up and being able to support something like that. So uh, I would still stick with the yeah we're going to pay a lot of money and then send you lots of information so we can get that nice juicy green bar up in the top with the existing CAs. As much as it it hurts me to say that, I'll try to keep telling the story to our security architect and see if he can sell it to the engineers. Yeah. So. Well, I have Google up here, so uh, so the answer oh is no, uh, and they and <laughs> they currently don't have plans to to uh, to, to build that in. So okay. so yeah, so there will still be a role uh, in your organization for using those uh, other C uh, CAs to uh, to build the extended validation. Are there any more questions? You guys look hungry for knowledge, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, just I mean, but go on their forums and keep telling them that they they uh, you want that and and. <laughs> That's that's uh, you know as being part of product management, you know that there's there's lots of ways of deciding what gets done sooner rather than later. Um, I don't know you know if there's a technical blockade or if that's just a, a lower priority um, uh, task. And so, if they have see that there's a groundswell of support, then that will change the priority of their. Uh, of their, 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 their and, and if, I, if I can go on just a tiny bit of a tangent here, I mean, th these whole things are just scams out of the box as well. <laughs> the fact that it's like, yeah, our job is to uh, basically vali validate the fact that you own this server, but tell you what, you can pay us more money and we'll really validate it, and then we're going to validate it so hard that we're going to give you this great thing in the browser. It's like, that's BS, honestly, because you should be doing that for everybody. The entire point is that you're verifying that I own this asset. That is your job. And you're telling me that I have to pay more money for you to do it the way you're supposed to? Like, that's, I share similar frustrations, I'm sure, as, as you do, is that it's like, yeah. that should not even be a differentiating part of their service, is that, well, yeah, we have poor validation and then great validation, <laughs> and even the great validation is not all that great. But you have to tell this Brand attached to their security. Yeah, and and I'm which is why I say this is a tangent because there's no real conclusion I can come to out of this other than it's just bogus that it happens. <laughs> yep. All right, we've got like about two more minutes. Uh, if, if anybody is uh, sitting on a question here, um, so you know if you haven't looked at Let's Encrypt on the uh, you know and, and taken a look at it, it's really easy set up. Um, you know, uh, just familiar. If, if you run your web server on a Unix-based machine, Linux-based machine, and you're not familiar with it, uh, don't just don't be scared. Just yep. go into it and follow the directions and, and put in the long-ass command lines. And if you have a problem, they have a forum, and it's they're very responsive. Um, it, it's go ahead. Oh, sorry, and, and it's the basically the EFF is now the organization that has taken over the software development project for the agent you run on your endpoints. So uh, there's not very many organizations out there that I would be overly like trusting of, of the sort of stuff that they put out, but it's open source software and it's pushed forward by an organization that is very well known for, for positive activism within the space. So, and it's literally just wget chmod run it and it does everything else for you. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody coming out tonight, and uh, y'all have a good rest of the con. Thanks.